Thank you, Joshi, and thank you all. It really is something that so many of you have come to listen to me speak. Now, uh, I think part of what I'm... One of the reasons I speak is to dispel stereotypes, for you to see, instead of knowing the number six million or one and a half million children who died during... Jewish children who died during the Holocaust, is to see a human being and to see some pictures of my family and to hear my story. Now, I think whatever your preconception of a Holocaust survivor was, I doubt that any of you expected me. Uh, the reason is, in all the years when I've been speaking, I always say to the audience, what were you expecting? And universally, they say, someone who is old. And I can assure you, I am old. <laughs> <laughs> and I will prove it. This is my birth certificate. And those of you who don't speak French, as I do no longer, it says, in the city of Brussels, on the 15th of February, 1940, a daughter was born Fanny to Jacob Zimmerbaum from Zobno in Poland and Sprinzer Perlman from Warsaw in Russia. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the where and all about why my mother came from Russia when she's from Warsaw, but any of you doing history will probably know that Poland was subdivided into uh, uh, between three uh, empires and that at one time in the 19th century uh, Warsaw was part of the Russian Empire but I'm not going to go too much into those sort of details now right now my story in a way starts before I was born the green line is my father's journey. Uh, it said on there he came from Zabno, which was the outskirts of a town called Tarnoff. Those of you who were here for the slideshow, uh, a lot of that was taken in Tarnoff and Krakow when I went back. And Tarnoff is um, a town about 50 miles east of Krakow. And my father was born around 1903, so well over a hundred years ago now. And uh, at that time, Tarnoff and Krakow were all part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, it was a province called Galicia. And uh, the Jews under the Austro-Hungarian Empire had had a relatively easier time than in other parts of Poland. And uh, he had gone to an ordinary school. He had mixed with... Uh, the town, of course, was predominantly um, uh, Polish Catholics, but 40% of the town were Jews. And they were all kinds of Jews. It actually was a very political area uh, of what became Poland. And uh, my father's sister, the only one of either my mother or father's siblings who survived the war, was very active in the Communist Party. So it was a, quite a political, liberal uh, household. But my father was unashamedly quite a bit of a, a villain, I think one might say. He, he used to tell stories about when he went to school that he and some friends, aged 11, would go and smoke and play cards. So uh, let's put it this way. As liberal as his family might have been, they were a bit worried about where this was going to lead to. And in his late teens, he was sent to Belgium uh, to a very religious cousin who was a diamond cutter. He w went there as a trainee apprentice and apparently my father lasted about three months in, in this type of uh, uh, atmosphere because, as he said, after three months he knew everything he needed to know and he went to Paris. Okay, now my mother's journey is the red one. 
She, as I said, she was born in Warsaw, and uh, I'm just giving you a brief outline at the moment. Uh, she actually was married in her early 20s to a French Jew, and she went to live in Paris, as had done most of her sisters and brothers. My mother was one of eight children. Sadly, her first husband died of tuberculosis and she was left with a young child, but she did not return to Warsaw. She remained in Paris. And in 1937, my parents met. My father, by this time, was quite a wealthy businessman. He had never married before. And as I said, my mother was a young widow. They were married in February 1938. However, within a year, uh, things had got hotted up. Uh, being a Polish Jew in Western Europe was actually uh, not going to be easy. And whereas they had been very integrated and assimilated, uh, once Poland was invaded and everyone knew that Germany would soon invade Western Europe, uh, their friends began, their non-Jewish friends began to be a bit shy of being seen with them. They would go to the theater and they would see a friend and wave to them and they started getting the cold shoulder. I do not believe this was anti-Semitism, it was fear. And a lot of what happened during the Holocaust was because fear was created. Anyway, now I will get on to the main story, which is at the end of 1939, my parents went to Brussels. My father thought Belgium would stay neutral. And uh, I was born in February and in May 1940, when I was three months old, um, the, the Nazis swept through the Netherlands, down through Belgium and France. Okay, now I'm going to go a bit more into the story. What I want you to just look at is the part of France that is shaded green. When France first was invaded, it was divided between the occupied zone, which is the cream-colored zone, and what was known as the free zone or Vichy, which ostensibly, and I use the word advisedly, was still independent. And then you will see the journey continues over the mountains, the Pyrenees, into Spain. Okay, right. Now, these are my maternal grandparents in Warsaw. Again, although Warsaw was un under the, Rus uh, the Russian Empire, and in many parts of Russia, the, the Jews had a really hard time, it was very limited in their occupation, were very poor, were very rural, and uh, uh, had very, very limited uh, contact with their neighbors. Warsaw actually, when, when Poland was first divided in the 18th century, Warsaw actually, for a time, was independent and was tied in with Krakow. So, uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not an historian, so I'm speaking in very broad strokes. The, the uh, Jews in, Poland, uh, in Warsaw were a lot more emancipated than a lot of the sort of mythologies about the Polish Jews are. Now, my maternal grandparents, they lived in Warsaw. My grandmother in this photo would be more or less about the same age that I am in her mid-70s. Uh, the picture was taken somewhere in the mid-1940s. She, believe it or not, had had eight living children, of which my mother was the second youngest. Uh, my grandfather is wearing uh, his hat or uh, a kippah, but his dress is very similar to what ordinary uh, middle-class Warsaw people would have worn. He worked in an office in the city. They lived in an apartment on the outskirts. And my grandmother ran a small dressmaking business from home. Okay, now this is my mother. 
Uh, this picture was taken in Paris around the time she met my father and as you can see she she's quite a chic lady she's uh, she's not impoverished uh, I always ask when I speak to school children to to tell me what they think of her and they they all think she's very fashionable anyway at the end of my talk I will show you a photo of her a year, a ten years later so take this picture into your memory this is my mother's younger brother uh, he was a pediatrician in Warsaw that's him and his wife and as you can see he has no head covering uh, how religious or otherwise they were I have no idea because post-war it was too painful for my mother to speak about as I said, my mother was the only one of my grandparents' eight children who survived the war. He, and I, I refer to them with pronouns because sadly I don't know their names because part of the story is that post-war we did not talk about it. Anyway, we know what happened to him because we were told by someone else who witnessed it he was a pediatrician he was working in the children's hospital the Jewish children's hospital inside the Warsaw ghetto during the uprising and he was taken out and shot on the spot so of all my mother's seven siblings he's the only one that we actually know what happened to him although we know that that the whole family died during the Holocaust <coughs> right now this is my father uh, that's a photo of him in Paris with some friends at a cafe just an ordinary man no, no head covering you know the impression I got from my parents is that pre-war they they were very assimilated I doubt they even went to a synagogue or kept any of the festivals <clears throat> these are some of my mother's sisters they would be my aunts and my cousins and I as I have said most of my mother's siblings had actually moved to Paris uh, most of her sisters were married to French professionals uh, doctors and lawyers and so when France first became occupied there was agreement between the Germans and the Vichy government that their own citizens would not be um, taken and uh, this in effect created a, f a friction between my aunts and my father and I'll go into that later another one of my mother's uh, sisters with her sons and as I say none of these people survived the Holocaust more more of the family this is my father's sister she's the only one who survived um, she Tarnoff as I probably mentioned was very politically active and she was a member of the Communist Party and uh, just before Poland was invaded she had gone to Moscow as an official in the Communist Party and she remained in Moscow throughout the war and she did survive the war okay back so this is a picture of my mother when she's expecting me and this is my mother with my half sister Lillian okay so my parents have gone to Belgium and uh, when I'm three months old the Germans invaded and immediately they began rounding up what were called the foreign Jews of which mainly were Polish Jews a lot of uh, Jews had left Poland after World War I when Poland was reunited as a country and different historians put a different pitch on it some will say they were given more freedom to travel others will say they were encouraged to leave Poland um, Poland had been a very religious country and in many parts of Poland there had been very strong anti-semitism for generations and it had been 
the way of life was for the younger generation on the whole to leave Poland. Uh, many had gone to Western Europe and others to the United States. So Western Europe had many, many Polish Jews and initially it was them and there were some German Jews if you've read Anne Frank a lot of the German Jews had gone into the Netherlands Holland uh, and so it was they and the Polish Jews that initially were rounded up because they didn't have the protection of a government and in theory in the beginning the French and Belgian Jews uh, were not uh, being rounded up. Initially it was the men as well. So my father was taken very early on and uh, he initially was put in a prison. Those of you who have seen for instance Schindler's List you will see the Jews being packed into sealed cattle trucks. However from Western Europe they were using ordinary trains and my father initially was in prison for a while while uh, the, the German army were using the trains for their own resources and whatnot. So he was in prison for quite a few months. And then one day, they, he and his group of uh, fellow prisoners were taken out and they were told they were being taken to a labor camp somewhere up north. Um, in fact, at that time, most of the camps were technically labor camps, although people died of starvation and cold, and a few of them got shot along the way. But also, the Germans, um, in order not to create panic, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, why did they go so willingly? Well, first of all, where else were they to go? But also, uh, the German at, had, had created this myth that, oh, we're only taking you to use for labor. Anyway, my father was put on a train, and it was an ordinary train, but they were all together in one compartment being looked after just by a couple of young soldiers. And the, as the train was going through France, uh, my father, who had lived in France most of his adult life, he knew the railway, he knew where the junctions were, and he spoke to his little group of friends near him, and he said, look, they're not watching us. The two soldiers were just up the other end doing whatever young men do, talking, playing cards, having a drink. And he said, they're not watching us. Look, if we sneak out the back, we're coming to a junction, the train will slow down, maybe even stop, and he said, we can jump off, they won't, they won't notice us. And his friends looked at him like he was mad, and this was absolutely typical, I've heard from other people, the attitude was, look, don't be a troublemaker, all right, we're going to a labor camp, we'll have to work, but, you know, don't be a troublemaker. Anyway, my father, because of the sort of person he was, he didn't care what anybody else said, and he snuck out, and he jumped off. And he said, as he lay on the track, watching the train edge away from him, he was waiting for it to stop, because he was certain that uh, the others, out of fear, because when they got to the other end and there was a hundred names on the list and only 99 men, uh, they knew they'd be in trouble. So he was expecting the train to stop and he said he was expecting them to come back and he would have just got a bullet in the head. And he said he didn't really care, he was expecting it. Anyway, it didn't happen. And it's a rather long, convoluted story, so I will condense it. But eventually, my father made the way to Paris, where he actually hid with a cousin of his. My mother's family, as I said, were all married to professionals and were French, and they really, the fear was that my father, being a Polish Jew, now an escape prisoner, no longer having identification papers, if he was found hiding with them, the whole family would be sent. And the belief at that time was being French, it wasn't going to happen to them. So he managed to find a cousin of his who took him in very reluctantly, and my father was in hiding with um, the cousin, 
and my mother stayed in Belgium for a little while. Uh, my father had a very large extended family and there were second cousins living in Brussels who took us under their wing. But eventually my mother was given permission. You couldn't just get on a train. You had to have a travel document. She went to the local police and said her husband had been taken. And luckily in those days there were no computers, there was no Google. <coughs> So they couldn't look him up and find out that actually he jumped off the train and wasn't in the camp. Uh, so they took pity on her, a widow with two young children, and she traveled back to Paris. And for a while we went and lived with my aunts and, and uncles. And as I said, I don't know their names. Okay, so I now go to the summer of 1941. And my father couldn't go outside in the street. He didn't have any documents, uh, and it was dangerous. His cousin used to go out to work every day, and the cousin's wife and children had actually gone away for the summer to the seaside. And uh, my father woke up one night, and he sensed there was something wrong. And... He, the street was absolutely quiet and you have to use your imagination in those days there weren't that many cars and things but it was a main road and occasionally you would hear a lorry and there just was silence and my father realized that something was going on <coughs> well because he couldn't go out in the daytime and because my father's main interest in life was playing cards uh, he had spent most of the days with the porter, the concierge. Most French apartments had, had uh, concierge. So for six, eight months, he had spent every day having a drink and playing cards with his newfound friend. So at three o'clock in the morning, he goes downstairs and wakes up the concierge and he says, I know something's happening. Can you go outside? So the concierge goes outside and he comes back in and he says, yes. And all these things now, and I have been back to France and I have looked up the archives, they're all very well recorded. It was a big roundup, again, of the men in this part of town. Anyway, the porter said it was the police, it was not the Nazis, it was the French police had come, they barricaded off the street and they had big lorries and because the Polish Jews as foreigners had to go and register every week, they knew exactly where these people lived. So they had lists and they were, the porters said they're going from building to building and they're bringing out the Polish Jewish men. Anyway, my father's cousin said to him, I am French, you know, I am not going to be taken, but if they find me hiding you, then they will, they will take me. And so just go out on the street and just give yourself up. And my father said, look, he said, I haven't got any identification papers. They're going to know that in effect, I'm, a, I'm an escaped prisoner. And they will take me and they will torture me to find out who has been hiding me. And I'm not a brave man. Under torture, I will have to tell them that it was you and they'll come and take you anyway. So uh, the cousin didn't have any option. Anyway, it was agreed. The porter said he would, when they came into the building, he would say that the family, the Reuben family, had actually gone away for the summer. And it was the beginning of the big roundups. Okay, so my, my the cousin wasn't happy about it, but he didn't. He could see that he was in in it anyway. So they went back upstairs, and the porter boarded over the outside of the door of the apartment as a security. And they heard the lorry stop outside the uh, apartment. It was a very small block, and they were just on the first floor. And they heard the lorry stop and they heard the police come out of the back and there was a Polish Jewish family living underneath um, 
in the apartment just underneath theirs and they heard the police banging on the door. They heard the man come to the door and the police said, you have to come with us and they heard the wife crying and pleading with the police not to take her husband. She had young children and the man turned around and said what millions of Jews said, look, they're just taking us for labor and if we don't make a fuss and I go, you know, okay, I'll have to work hard for a few years, but soon we'll be back together again. Anyway, they heard being marched off into the lorry, back of the lorry being shut, and then they heard the police coming back into the building. Now, the cousin was French, and at that time, they were not picking up the French, but they were so worried that the porter would tell on them. My father said his heart was beating so loudly. They were hiding under the bed as though that would have made a difference. And his knees were knocking and his teeth were chattering and he was sure they could hear it. And they heard them saying, are there any other Jews in the building? And they heard the porter say, oh, well, there's a French family upstairs, but they've gone away for the summer. And really, you know, they were very surprised because the porter, although he had befriended my father, he, in effect, was putting himself in danger. Anyway, they went away. And I told you, my aunt had been a member of the Communist Party, and needless to say, my father was not that way inclined in any way. However, in the 1920s, she had come for a lot of international conferences to, to France, and they had met up, and he had met their friends, so he had contacts in Paris. And to cut a very uh, long story short, uh, he was smuggled out. And actually, they came and took us all, my, my, my mother, my sister, and myself. And we were taken to uh, what was known as a safe house, although it actually was a farm in, in the forest of Fontainebleau. And they were talking about what to do. Now, this was uh, June 1941. And uh, as of yet, the, the women were not, women and children were not being rounded up. And it, it really, with everything that was going on, there was still this myth that they were just taking the men for um, labor and, you know, no one else would be in danger. And yeah, tough times were hard, but, you know, we'd be okay. Anyway, to smuggle uh, someone into Vichy which was still the free zone where Jews were still quite free and they were not being rounded up. Uh, it was still dangerous. It was a border. And um, my father, being a man, they were able to take him down within a mile or so and he was able to walk over the fields. But a woman with young children, she wouldn't have been able to do it. So my mother remained in Paris with my sister and myself, and we actually stayed what my mother very grandly called a hotel, but I think it was more like a boarding house, which was run by people involved in what became known as the resistance. So we were there for another year. My father was down in Vichy, and this is him. He was able to register. He was given new papers. He was in a little village quite close down to the Spanish border. And he worked on a farm. And he was there for nearly another year. Now, we're in Paris, and now I'm coming up to July 1942, when what became known as the final solution really got into gear. Uh, before that, as I said, many Jews, and not just Jews, I mean, um, there was the camp Ravensbrook, which was a woman's camp. It, wasn't a, it was mainly political prisoners and things, and there were most terrible things happening there, uh, experiments and whatnot, and there was Dachau. And uh, Auschwitz, actually, um, some of the first Jews sent to Auschwitz was 
were from Tarnoff, which is where my father came, I think the numbers were something like 50 to 250, something like that. They were some of the first Jews, uh, sorry, first people taken into Auschwitz, which at that time was not actually, per se, a death camp, although people did die as such. Anyway, um, my father was down there, and my mother went into the police station. Every week she had to sign on just as a foreigner, and she went. And this is me, and you're allowed to laugh. As you can see, I'm a rather plump little girl. Look at those little fat legs. I can blame my mother the fact that I have a weight problem. She was so proud of this photo. And as she would remind me many years later, whenever I was rude to her or anything, that there hadn't been enough food to go around, and rather than have any food herself, she had fed me. Right, so there she is. With I was probably a bit older than this. This is probably 18 months old. Anyway, two and a bit, my mother goes to the local police station to register, as she had to every week with these two young children. My sister at that time was about seven and a half and I was just over two. July 1942. And it was the same two policemen each week that registered all the Jews. And it was a tiny little room. It was a boiling hot day. And uh, my mother goes along and one policeman was rather kindly and gentle. So she goes in and he's got a huge queue of people in front of him. And the other one was quite a nasty, very anti-Semitic, very nasty man. And people were terrified of him. So he only had one or two people in front of him. So my mother with two young children on a very hot day, she feels it's best just to get in and out as quickly as possible. So she goes and she's standing with only maybe one or two people in front of us with her two children. And as you can see, I was so heavy, I couldn't even stand up. So she's holding me. And you saw she was a tiny little lady. She was barely five foot. So she's holding me with a very jealous older sister who gets very resentful and starts pulling on my dress, trying to pull me down, and starts shouting at mummy, saying, put her down, pick me up, I want you to pick me up. So, of course, I start crying, my sister's yelling, my mother starts crying, and the policeman went absolutely berserk. And actually, it was the most fortuitous thing that could have happened because he turned on my mother and yelled at her and told her to go outside and wait until she could calm us down. Anyway, she waited all day outside, terrified. She was a very gentle woman. And she waited until everyone had registered. And then she crept in and went to the other policeman because by now everyone had gone and she gave our name and again I, I probably have to remind you as I tell all the uh, school kids there was no such things as computers in those days so no Google so they had physical lists and my mother goes up and gives our name to the policeman that she saw every week and who probably knew who she was. And she gives our name, which is Zimitbaum, which of course is at the bottom of the list. And he starts looking on page one and page two. And my mother, thinking to move things on, she starts saying, no, 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 Zimitbaum, you know, at the bottom of the list. And she's trying to turn the page over to show him where our name is. And he got rather brusque and pushed her hand aside and said, no, that's not you. And then he turned to the other guy, and this was a very brave thing for him to have done. And I've been, this, this was the first big roundup of women and children, and it, I don't know, if, have any of you read or seen the film Sarah's Key? Any of you familiar with the book? Well, this was the first big roundup of women and children in Paris. 
And the thing is, most of the women were Polish, but the children were French-born. So when they were rounded up, the Germans, with all that was going on, they were very legalistic, and they had an agreement that French citizens would not be deported. So everyone, the women and children who were rounded up, they were kept in the velodrome over a very long, hot weekend. And this, this is very well documented. And there was no water, no sanitation, no food. And while decision was made, and in effect, what they did, they gave the mothers the option of either taking their children with them or leaving them behind. And something like 10,000 children were left behind in the care of an organization called the OSC. So at just barely two and a quarter, I wouldn't have survived whether my mother had taken us to the camp or whether she had left us behind. Over those few days, I would have probably died. Uh, did any of you see the Eichmann show last night? No? Okay. Because they did mention this. It, it, it was a very notorious rounding up, and something like 10,000 children got deported in 1942 straight to the camps, and they were immediately exterminated. Okay, so my mother was warned that we would be taken. She went back to the hotel and they said they would try to smuggle us out. Well, July gets light very early and they came for us before five o'clock in the morning and they woke my mother up and they said the lorry's here and the way they smuggled people out, uh, they didn't have washing machines in those days so um, particularly hotels and restaurants would use like a factory, a laundry factory and they had huge lorries with very large um, baskets and they would hide the red people and cover them over with laundry. So five o'clock in the morning, they wake my mother up and say, get your kids up and get them, you know, we've got to go. Because once it gets light, if people looking out the window see what's going on, someone would have informed the police and, you know, this is the way it worked as much from fear because if someone looked out the window, they didn't know whether someone saw them seeing this and if they didn't tell, you know, they would be in trouble as well. So it was fear. The whole thing was fear. Anyway, uh, my mother said, I can't take my children out you know, without washing them and dressing them and giving them breakfast. And they said, you've got five minutes because it's going to get light. Anyway, they did get us out and they did smuggle us into Vichy, which must have been very dangerous for them because the Germans weren't stupid. Anyway, we got down into Vichy, we got down to the village where my father was and for a little while we were together. And that's me, I'm a little bit older here. And then, <clears throat> within weeks, <coughs> they, they started rounding up the men again. As I said, um, it was the summer of 1942 when the death camps then were in full force and uh, the deportations. Uh, a huge percent of the, not just the Jews, but people who died, happened over a period of about six months from uh, June, July 42 to about March the next year. Uh, there was a Camp Belschitz where my uh, Tarnoff parents would have gone and that, uh, those of you who were here before I was showing uh, pictures, uh, about 500,000 Jews were exterminated there over a very short period of time. It's when they finally had the gas chambers going. So my father was rounded up again. He was in an internment camp uh, waiting to be deported. And again, he managed to escape. He befriended the guards, who actually were Corsicans. It was a French camp, but they were using Corsicans as the guards. My father, again, he played his way out of two camps he, with cards. He loved playing cards. Also, because he had been in the jewelry trade, 
all his possessions, everything he had, he had put into uh, small gemstones and things, very colorful, and he had used these to bribe his way out. Anyway, my father managed to get over the mountains into Spain. Again, we didn't go with him because climbing over the mountains. Also, there was an awful lot of collaboration going on and it was all very dangerous. Anyway, he got into Spain, down to Barcelona. The Quakers were acting as the relief organization and they told him there was a camp in Spain called the Camp Miranda. And I've looked that up because when I was told about it and later spoke about it, I was told there hadn't been a camp. Well, there was a camp where every male, 15 and over, uh, Jewish male who escaped into Spain were being uh, kept. Anyway, they said to my father, if you can get to Portugal, you know, just get to Portugal, uh, get to the British Embassy, as you're Polish, you might be able to join the Polish Free Forces. Well, technically, although he was born Polish, Poland itself had rescinded all citizenship of anyone who had been outside the country more than five years. It was now an occupied country. So, um, you know, being Polish, he had no protection of any country. Anyway, he went to the British Embassy, who were a bit surprised to see him. And, of course, they, they didn't know if he was a spy or what. So they just said to him, well, if you go to the Polish Embassy and get some sort of papers to prove who you are and an exit visa, not only could we not get visas into country, we had to get an exit visa. And except for a very few heroic uh, diplomats uh, who you might have heard of, very few uh, embassies were giving exit visas. Anyway, by this time Vichy had fallen and my father had sent the guide back to us, but we hadn't turned up. And Vichy had fallen and, as I said, the deportations of the women and children from Vichy and all Jews, French Jews, old Jews, young Jews, everyone, were uh, being sent to the extermination camps. So he was quite certain we had gone. Uh, he knew what had, that, well, he didn't know what had happened to his parents, but for a while he had been able to write to them, but the letters had started being returned. So my father goes along to the Polish embassy, really not knowing what's going to happen to him. <coughs> but he said he didn't care anymore. He goes into the interview room, uh, an official comes in and my father said by this time he was so demoralized he didn't even look up <coughs> and the official asked his name and he said Isaac Zimmerbaum and the official said where are you from and my father said Tarnoff and he said there was something in the official's voice but he, it didn't register with him and the official said to him you're Jerry Zimmerbaum's brother, aren't you? And my father looked up, and there, sitting opposite him, was his brother's best friend from school. Uh, he was a Catholic, uh, Catholic Pole uh, who knew my father. Anyway, he gave my father uh, identification papers and an exit visa, and my father went back to the British Embassy and he was able to join the Polish Free Forces and that was how he eventually got to England. Now, my mother did manage to escape over the mountains with us. It was late October 1942. There was snow in the mountains, there were Germans in the mountains. It was very, very dangerous. Fishy was just falling. Anyway, we did get into Spain and Whereas before Spain had been turning the Jews back, they did allow us in. My sister was put in a convent. My mother and I were initially in prison. And the Quakers came to my mother and they said, look, the expectation was that Franco would allow the Germans in. He, he technically was their ally. And uh, we would all be deported. And America had finally sent... 500 visas for the children trapped in France. 
<coughs> but they had been deported and they found there were about a hundred children like my sister and myself, many were orphans, a few of them had relatives. And the Quakers said, give your children up. So we were taken into the care of the Red Cross <coughs> and this is the, a picture of the Red Cross house in Lisbon where we were kept to be sent to America. <coughs> and this is the little group of children, there were about 20 of us that went in June 1943 and I'm the little one in front so I would have been three and a half. This is my half-sister Lillian who was about eight, eight and a half. And this little girl, Denise, her, her family were friends of our family and she sort of took care of me on the ship. Now, we crossed over in October. The Americans had sent the visas, the ship with the visas in November. So why had it taken all this time for us to go to America? Uh, right, now this is a letter I found dated June 1941 signed by Albert Einstein which was sent to uh, a, a, Jewish agents, a Jewish organization in America begging them to organize visas. So it took them quite a while to get all that organized. And then this is a telegram I found April 1943 and basically what it's saying is that with regards to the children's project, that means sending the children to America, the following children have presented, but the American consulate is holding up consideration for the visas desiring French passports because the visas were for French children and unfortunately some of our mothers hadn't managed to bring passports. I mean, this is how, in the middle of everything, and this, by 1943, I mean, the world did know what was going on, and as I said, people were being uh, exterminated in the camps wholesale, and yet an American consulate was refusing to let the children go because they didn't have French passports. And it actually mentions my sister, Lillian Malaga, and myself, Fanny Zimmerbaum, who's Belgian, the sister of Lillian, who is French, and please discuss with the State Department. Anyway, <clears throat> we were allowed to go, and this is the manifest of the ship that we arrived in America on, and interesting, here you can just see under all the things that we had to fill in, uh, the question here is race. So we were all Hebrews. So even in the 1940s, America had a very active racial policy. <clears throat> right, now, this is a picture of myself and Denise. My sister was very ill and they thought she had tuberculosis. So we were separated, she was put in a hospital, Denise and I were in an orphanage and a family came along and I was told I was adopted, but it, it technically was, I was fostered. My name was changed to Joan Farrell, and my whole identity was changed, my culture was changed, my language was changed. It, it's pretty obvious that we were told we mustn't be foreign, so to this day I cannot speak a word of French anymore. And I had a new family. This is me in my new home in America with my new mother and my new dog. And uh, this actually was my father with his cousin, Doris. And he was dean of the local medical school. Uh, so it was a very cultured upmarket home. And that's my new adopted sister. And one day I came home from school in 1947 to be told I didn't actually belong to this family. No one spoke about Holocaust, but I was told that my family had been in the war and long story short, I was put on a plane, sent to England. My mother had managed to come 
And this is my mother working in a factory. This photo is taken exactly 10 years after the last one. And I think, as they say, a picture says a thousand words. And you can see her, her parents, every one of her sisters and brothers, nieces and nephews, they had all died in the war. Both my parents were very traumatized, completely impoverished. <coughs> And it was a pretty tough existence for us uh, living together. We lived in a tiny, tiny apartment. My sister and I slept on a couch together. And my parents were very, very traumatized. And as I said, <coughs> most of their fam family had died. My sister just had one, one, uh, one, uh, sister. My father had only one sister who survived. She came out of Poland in 1955 and went, went to live in France and she had a young son and so I have one first cousin alive and a half-sister and that is our family. Anyway, <clears throat> I shall finish. I've been talking for nearly an hour. And I'm very happy to answer any questions.